Please, won't you pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. We bear witness to life conquering death every single day, right? So we need to proclaim it with our words and with our lives. Yesterday, I, I had a big day yesterday. I did a funeral in the morning for one of the great pillars of this church, Nelson Ellery Mather III, Nelson Mather. If you did not know him, that is sad. He led a remarkable life, former chair of the diaconate of this church who championed equal standing for women deacons back in the day, leader of two capital campaigns that built our religious education wing, dear friend to so many in our congregation, husband of 56 years to our Judy Mather, his fingerprints and his heart are all over this place. He hallows the halls and the walls. He died a year ago after a devastating long illness that literally silenced his voice five years before. Together we named and proclaimed the kind of love that calls us to endure everything that is painful and hard, the kind of love that bears all things and hopes all things, even most impossibly in death. It's that same enduring love of God that has carried us through this terrible and beautiful year. Amen? So those of you who know me well know that in the midst of all the losses we have suffered, big and small, the moratorium on singing has been a dagger in my heart. The moratorium on congregational singing, the silencing of choirs, the shuttering of Broadway, that has felt to me like the devil rubbing salt in our collective wounds. And so yesterday afternoon, after Nelson's beautiful goodbye, I hopped in my car with my husband and my son, and I snuck off to Barbara's new hometown, Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We did a cross commute. I commuted there yesterday. She commuted here today. <laughs> we didn't see each other until now, though. And I went to the Seacoast Repertory Theater where they were putting on a live production of Godspell. You guys, <laughs> you guys, a musical indoors, in the theater, with live actors. Young voices that were silenced by COVID for far too long, singing and dancing in front of a live audience. Life defying death. I had been waiting for this moment for a year. I don't think I realized I had been holding my breath <laughs> that whole time. So I immediately burst into tears like a sorry sack <laughs> when the producer came out to introduce the show. <laughs> All he did was come out to tell us about the COVID regulations and I immediately started bawling. I was just so grateful. I haven't been to a live church service that I'm not leading in over a year and I was finally in church, you know what I mean? My mask was soaked with tears. I didn't stop crying for the entire production. It was embarrassing for my son. I have seen Godspell approximately one million times, so you'd think that I could hold it together. <laughs> I guess something deep within me thought that the music really had died, you know? Bye, bye, Miss American, bye. Something deep within me believed that the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost took the last train for the coast and were never coming back. And so I cried like a dead friend had come back to life. At the end of Godspell, the finale, how many of you have seen Godspell? I mean, it's from the 70s. I mean, do you, still, do you remember it? 
Some of us know it like by heart. A lot of you have seen it. Anyway, at the end of God's Bell, the finale takes you through the suffering of Good Friday and the death of Holy Saturday in just a few minutes of music and then moves on to the resurrection, right? So when Jesus dies, the cast sings, Oh God, you're dead, over and over again. Oh God, you're dead. And then Jesus comes down from the cross smiles at his friends and walks off stage into the light and one cast member slowly lifts up her head from where she has been weeping and sings a proclamation. Do you remember what it is? Long live God, long live God, long live God. Long live God. And then eventually the whole cast joins in and it gets more and more exuberant and they dance and they sing. A resurrection appearance, a defiant hallelujah in the face of death. Long live God. Can I get a witness? The story we read from the Gospel of Luke this week is another resurrection appearance, similar in some ways to the one we read from the Gospel of John last week. Immediately preceding this passage, there's a heartbreaking story that takes place three days after Jesus died. You might remember it. It's about the Emmaus Road. So on the road to Emmaus, Jesus' friends walk aimlessly, and that's a road to nowhere in particular They're devastated with grief. It was the day the music died for them, right? And the resurrected Christ, it turns out, is walking with them, but in their overwhelming sadness, they don't recognize him, right? They perceive him to be a stranger, and the stranger sort of peppers them with questions, and the disciples say some of the most painful words in Scripture. They say, we had hoped that he was the one to save Israel. Had hoped, past tense, right? No longer hoping. In their impossible, overwhelming grief, their hope had been lost. The music had died. The Father, Son, the Holy Ghost took the last train for the coast They weren't coming back. And they finally recognized that it was Jesus who had been walking with them when he takes bread and breaks it at the table. That's where the world begins and ends, at the table. And they wonder aloud, how did we not know it was him? Were not our hearts burning inside us? They are ashamed that they are so wrapped up in their grief that they fail to notice God is in their midst. And that's when we pick up the conversation that they are having in our scripture from Luke this week. When our scripture passage begins, they are having that conversation. Why was our heart not burning inside us? And Jesus stands among them in the midst of this conversation about shame, and he says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. And they are anything but peace-filled in that moment. They jump about 14 feet in the air. They thought they had seen a ghost this time. And once again, Jesus is patient and willing to help them in their unbelief. Do not be frightened, he says. I am not a ghost. Touch and see my wounds. And the disciples were joyful and still disbelieving and wondering all at the same time. And they wait for him to say something profound. The God they thought had been silenced forever. And he opens his mouth to speak and they wait with bated breath. And what does he say? What's for dinner? (laughs) Jesus hasn't eaten since last Thursday at supper with them. 
He has since suffered and died, begging for water on the cross. He's endured a day in the tomb and has made his way back to life. It makes sense that he's hungry. What's for dinner, he asks. The disciples' hearts burn inside them, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And they make room for Jesus at the table to chow down on some broiled fish. And it is a place once again to celebrate the terrible victory. When his hunger is satiated, he has the strength to say to his friends the words of wisdom they awaited. He shows them that love has defied death's power as he had prophesied, and they are to proclaim the same thing to all nations along with repentance and forgiveness. You are witnesses of these things, he says. And witnessing is not a choice. It is a call to action. It is a call to change direction, which is what repentance means. It is a call to forgive ourselves most of all. It is a call to recognize God in those who hunger and thirst and make, wi- uh, make room for them at the table. It is a call to proclamation. We are witnesses of these things, love, defying death's power. Right after September 11th, you probably remember this, in 2001, the signs all over the subways read, do you remember this? If you see something, what? Say something. If you see something, say something. They were an attempt to get people to take a more active role in reporting suspicious behavior so we could stop terrorism together. And the campaign meant to exhort us, don't just sit passively by as an observer, right? Tell about it. When, and when you are a witness in a court of law, you are not supposed to keep what you've seen to yourself, right? Your role is to what? To testify, to tell it. That's right. In the gospel, Jesus has subpoenaed all of us to testify to God's work of death-defying love in the world. We are the witnesses, whether or not we want to be, whether or not we are comfortable with that role, whether or not we have the time or the inclination. As witnesses, we need to tell about it when we see love conquering hate, when we see love conquering death. When we see love revolution seeding itself in the world, we need to see something and then say something, right? A grieving, had hoped world awaits that message. Andy Stanley writes Sometimes I just want to stop. Talk of COVID, of looting, of brutality. I lose my way. I become convinced that this new normal is real life. And then, then I meet an 87-year-old who, is, who talks of living through polio and diphtheria and Vietnam protests and yet is still enchanted with life. He seemed surprised when I said that 2020 must be especially challenging for him. No, he said, slowly looking at me straight in the eyes. I learned a long time ago to not see the world through the printed headlines. I see the world through the people that surround me. I see the world with the realization that we love big. Therefore, I choose to write my own headlines. Husband loves wife today. Family drops everything to come to grandma's bedside. He patted my hand. Old man makes new friend. His words collide with my worries, freeing them from the tether I had been holding tight, and they float away. I am left with a renewed spirit and a new way to write my own headlines. Beloved, we are the witnesses of God in our midst. So pay attention. 
pay attention to your hearts burning inside of you. Believe that love does indeed rise up out of the grave. Recognize Jesus in those who are wounded, and especially in those who hunger and make room at your table. And then write new headlines, for God's sake, write new headlines. If you see something, say something. Change the narrative. Turn off and tune out the conspiracy theories, the pundits, the idolatrous ideas, ideology that profits off of the lie that half of the country is your enemy. No. Love and repent of all that fake news and believe the good news. Love's the boss of us. Love connects us across all our divisions. Love defies even death. Proclaim resurrection. In every place you have witnessed love's power to heal, tell the story. Long live God. There's a song in God's Bell that Jesus sings. Um, it's a little known song. It's called Beautiful City. And I want to close with the words from it. Out of the ruins and rubble, out of the smoke, out of our night of struggle, can we see a ray of hope, one pale thin ray reaching for the day, that we can build a beautiful city. Yes, we can, yes, we can. We can build a beautiful city, not a city of angels, but we can build a city of men. We may not reach the ending, but we can start slowly but truly mending, brick by brick, heart by heart. Now, maybe now, we start learning how. When your trust is all but shattered, when your faith is all but killed, when you give up bitter and battered, or you can slowly start to build. A beautiful city, yes we can. Yes, we can. Amen.